Okay, hello everybody. We're going to get started. And um, actually, Eduardo Garcia Rolland here in headquarters is going to give a brief introduction. Then we're going to um, get into the presentations. So over to you, Eduardo. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for joining us for this webinar, Engaging Fathers to Improve Results. Uh, we are we are very we are delighted to have uh, Kyle Pruett and Judith Sherman who are joining us. Um, but before that, I wanted to to mention that this webinar is a, a follow-up event uh, to the to a previous webinar that we have the 8th of November, which um, was under the title Male Involvement for uh, Early Childhood Development and HIV Results. Um, so the the previous webinar. Uh, it was um, very successful, and there was a, a lot of interaction with uh, with the participants. Um, and basically, we realized we needed a follow-up webinar, and that's why we are all together today. In the previous webinar, we we have uh, um, I spoke uh, f uh, as part of UNICEF headquarters with a little overview on male engagement and some of the biases that exist against. Um, uh, main involvement in um, research and in uh, the implementation of programs. We have Yasmin Sirali uh, from Mother Education Foundation from Turkey. Uh, and we also have Gary Baker from Promundo, uh, who gave us great, uh, a great presentation. Uh, unfortunately, Garth Jaffet couldn't join us from South Africa, talking about the um, engagement of uh, mass media and the promotion of, uh, of engagement of, of um, um, fathers. And finally, um, either Kelvin, Nindi, or Judith Sherman were going to present on a, a program in Malawi, HIV AIDS program in Malawi. And unfortunately, uh, there were some technical problems and they didn't. But so we have today, we have the, 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 we are lucky because uh, Judith Sherman is going to join us from Malawi and is going to present us this uh, UNICEF, uh, UNICEF program. So the two presenters today, we have only two presenters, which uh, will give us uh, more time for uh, discussion. Uh, the, third one is, the first one is going to be Kyle Pruett, who you probably have heard about. Uh, Kyle was incredibly kind and generous to, to accept our invitation to participate in this webinar. Uh, he's an international known child psychiatrist and expert on children, family relationships, and fathers. And the unique ability to share his medical knowledge and other information in plain English makes him highly sought after by the media, government agencies, and the business community. Dr. Pruitt inspires and captivates audiences of all kinds at the global level with a provocative, passionate style touched by personal warmth and, and humor. Uh, some of the of the Pruitt's accomplishments I can mention is he's a clinical professor of child psychiatry at Yale School of Medicine, prominent author of uh, award-winning books, international speaker who presented at the United Nations Summit on Fathers, uh, media personality and lifetime TV series host, column, columnist and frequent contributor to national publications, pioneer and researcher on fathers and their children, consultant to Fortune 500 companies. Anyways. So we are really very, very lucky to have uh, Kyle with us. Thank you very much. Uh, so he's going to make a presentation. Some of you have uh, filled a, a, a little um, um, survey that we did prior to, to this webinar on um, how friendly your programs or programmings are to fathers. And maybe Kyle is going to make a mention of that during her presentation. I don't know. Otherwise, we can talk about it later on. Then we have some clarifications, and then uh, uh, Judy is going to uh, to talk and make the presentation of this program in uh, UNICEF Malawi. Uh, Judy Sherman is the chief of HIV in in Malawi. Previously, he was, she was in in Zimbabwe, and I've heard a lot of good things. I don't know her yet. Uh, but I heard great things about Judith as a, as a leader in thinking out of the box uh, with innovative programming, including some amazing um, ideas like using drones in, in, in Malawi. So I will be very excited to also hear uh, her speaking. So without further ado, I will be delighted to give the floor to Kyle. Kyle, welcome to, to the webinar, and thanks so much for, for um, helping us.
Okay, great. I see the I see the the presentation is already uh, on the screen. So, um, Kyle, if you can hear me. Kyle, we cannot hear you. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me? Okay. Yes, now we can hear you. All right. Um, good. So I'll, I'll start over. Thank you, Natalie. And Eduardo, thank you for the invitation uh, to be part of this discussion, um, to follow up the previous webinar. I, I think you've already accomplished one of the um, you, one of the major hurdles to making this discussion worldwide, which is to often people do it at once and give up and move on and go back and do what they were doing before. The challenge to um, to really encourage male involvement uh, across cultures and across the globe um, is not new, and it is one that we have uh, we have begun to embrace, partly because of the rather remarkable changes that are occurring in the cultures that we all serve. Margaret Mead was one of the first folks to point attention to this, the great anthropologist who um, studied in the South Pacific and family formation. And I was rather startled to find this quote. Actually, one of my graduate students pointed it out to me years ago. <clears throat> the primary task of every society to teach men how to father. I don't know how you feel when you see that, but I want to go, what does she mean? Um, because that's not what we're doing. And... Um, uh, why would it be the primary task? And I've, as I've thought about it with various people from various cultures, um, ideas get uh, floated like they're not going to learn it on their own. And if they don't learn it, men will not develop their full nurturing capacity or their ability to serve the community beyond being a hunter, a gatherer, or a warrior. And it is their children whose lives are most dramatically affected by their competence. And um, that we have um, we have fallen so simply into the mode that only it is the mother's responsibility and therefore it is the mother's fault when things go wrong. Families have changed remarkably. The economic changes around the world have brought men into contact with their children in ways that we have not seen since before the Industrial Revolution in the West. So I want you to keep this quote in mind as we have our conversation today. Um, I also wanted to begin the discussion with a survey monkey, which was Natalie was very, very helpful in getting to all of you. And uh, we have a couple of dozen responses, and, and we, if we, at the, the end of the presentation, I will be uh, discussing those. But the main, the main information back from them is this is something that you are beginning to think about. You're not quite sure about how it applies to your work, but it is clearly a conversation that has begun by the families that you, uh, that you serve. Let's talk a little bit about how this even gets on the radar. How do children even experience men? Because men do not father. Men do not mother, excuse me. Fathers do not mother any more than mothers father. Uh, we all notice those differences. And we notice that when fathers try to mother, it simply doesn't work. It's, uh, it's as though it's a left-handed proposition for a right-handed world. Um, this is becoming increasingly important because we are more keenly aware than ever about the importance of a good start. And being uh, the first thousand days of life are so critical. Imagine how much better they would go if fathers were part of <clears throat> that in a positive way, supporting not only the mother and her job, but the child in their own development. And as we'll see later, it profoundly changes the father's experience. A few surprising scientific facts, just to freshen uh, the soup of this discussion. We are now aware that fathers go through profound hormonal changes pre- and post-delivery. We thought it was just the mother's body that was changing, obviously, to prepare for lactation, and labor and delivery, etc. But it turns out that the father's body is also going through significant change, drops 
in testosterone, rises in estrogen, and an almost historic rise, in his experience, of oxytocin, which is this remarkable, uh, we are now calling it the relationship hormone, um, which, as you can imagine, <clears throat> its arrival would be very timely if uh, you would like to fall in love with your infant. Um, to be awash in the oxytocin would be a very helpful phenomenon. So having him present at delivery, having involved in prenatal care, having him think about his particular role <clears throat> will all blend into strengthening his, um, his activity in the life of the child and the mother. We are very aware of very high comorbidities between maternal and paternal postpartum. Yes, there's a large epidemiologic study from England that shows us that for every two women that have a, are suffering from postpartum depression, there is one man, and it is an unfortunate child if those happen to be his parents. The main reason mothers do not respond to treatment uh, for their postpartum depression is that their partner is equally depressed, which is, goes unrecognized and untreated, and so her recovery is slowed significantly. <clears throat> father's vocabulary as a stronger predictor than mother's of language competence at three. That's a surprise. It certainly was to me when I saw it as I looked at the material. It became clear that the researchers weren't sure what the cause and effect was, but that they had recorded this language competence um, being stronger when the father's vocabulary was richer than fathers who were not experiencing a rich vocabulary. It's especially surprising since mothers and fathers do not talk to their children in the same way. Fathers tend not to use as much mother ease. Fathers tend to use uh, more formal language constructions. Well, maybe this is a result of that. Um, you'll hear fathers often say, I'm not going to do baby talk because I want them, people aren't going to be talking to them that way in the world, and so I want them to get ready to recognize their own language. They have these reasons for their behavior. And finally, we are now aware <clears throat> that when co-partnering is successful, particularly in the second year of life during toddler, during the terrible twos, that when fathers have been engaged from early on, the terrible twos are not nearly as terrible. So these are some disconnected scientific uh, uh, sort of points to get you pondering. What is it that is going on um, in this world of fathers and children and what, is it, what effect does, is it going to have on the well-being of the children down the road? <clears throat> we have been looking at maternal and paternal behavioral trends, um, both in, uh, in the West and also particularly in, in, in South America, some Asian studies. The studies are few and far between, but I've tried to put together here a very brief list of some of the distinguished paternal behavioral patterns. And you might think of these as whether you see them in these clinics or much less your own families. A preparation for activation and stimulation seems to be a characteristic of paternal involvement with their children. Rough housing, far more common among fathers and children, even their daughters, uh, than mothers. Mothers uh, seem to have uh, the attitude, you've already used my body. Thanks very much. If you want to play with a body, go play with his. Um, Mothers tend to spend much more of their physical time with their children, soothing and comforting. Fathers also like to seem to surprise or, or behave unpredictably with their children as a way of activating them. Mothers are often trying to calm them down and keep, uh, keep rituals and routines going. Play, preparation for place in the world versus relationships. This is an interesting one in, in, in many cultures, maybe the most. I've seen this in the Middle East. I've seen it in South America. I've seen it in Southeast Asia and also the aboriginal populations of northern Canada. <clears throat> Fathers discipline in a different way. Mothers discipline in a way that says, when you are not listening to me, our relationship is in trouble. We are not friendly, and I'm not going to be meeting your needs until you get your behavior under control. Father's less interested in that message, more interested in stop misbehaving, you'll never get a job or have any friends. It's a kind of real world um, message that comes from discipline. It's not that our relationship is going to suffer. It's that your relationship with the world is going to suffer if you don't get yourself under control. Frustration tolerance versus facilitating. You'll see 
mothers often tipping the playing field for an advantage for the child, both socially and academically. Fathers are a little more likely to hold their children to the line <clears throat> and stand by as they cry, trying to learn how to tie their shoes, knowing that someday the child's going to get teased for not being able to do that in, at school. <clears throat> And strong support for autonomy, and particularly getting getting comfortable in the world beyond the mother. Those are often some of the important connections that fathers and their children have. We've been under the influence of, a, of attachment theory for many years, helping us understand um, at least part of what's happening between parents and their children when they're growing up and learning how to trust other people. But when we've tried to use the same research instruments that we look at, at attachment for mothers with fathers, they don't work. Um, <clears throat> again, it's not the right fit. Secure attachment to mothers provides comfort when the child is upset or distressed. That's what attachment to the mother is. It's very clear. It starts in infancy and sometimes never goes away. Fathers provide a kind of security during excitement through a sensitive and challenging support when the child's exploratory system is aroused. This is a, uh, <clears throat> let me give you an example of this that I discovered when I was working with some Arab um, couples in the Middle East. The father would come home from work and the child would want to play with them and he'd get down on the floor and the father and the child would start to play with the father's beard and they would wrestle around and this, to this two year old got a hold of the father's beard and just yanked with all his might. And the father said, ouch, that hurts, you can't do that. And so the child sort of got a little ashamed a little bit. But of course, as a two year old, he came back and did it again two minutes later. This time the father sends him to the corner and says, you can't play with me until you stop doing that hurts. And the child goes and sits in the corner and then comes back and tries it one more time. And this time the father says, our play is done. <clears throat> he starts to cry. The mother's upset with the father for being rough on him. But what the father is saying is, I have to teach you where the edge is. If you don't know where the edge is, you will be in trouble with the people around you, society, all your life. And so my job is to teach you when you're excited where the edge of that is, where, where the edge of safety is. And that's a very important lesson when we think about what happens to children in the absence of that particular form of attachment behavior, it's pretty clear that they get into trouble very quickly and pretty soon juvenile authorities are in their lives. <clears throat> this may be the most important slide I'll show you because it has to do with the child outcomes of involved fathering. These are 300 studies that I've put together um, with my wife in the book called Partnership Parenting. Uh, the majority are from the West, but not all. Behavioral, educational, and emotional. Reduce contact with juvenile justice for some of the reasons we just talked about. Delay in initial sexual activity and obviously the desired result of reduced pregnancy. Something about having, about being treasured by both your father and your mother makes you value your own body more. Reduced rates of divorce. Less reliance on aggressive conflict resolution. Children, that language stuff that they learn from fathers and mothers allows them to be better problem solvers and they're less likely to be go for a violent solution immediately. Higher grade completion and income. Math competence in girls, especially powerful. Something about the father's interest in the girl is something more than just his little princess, but she has a mind and, uh, and can be a, a powerful person in the world. That kind of affirmation seems to show up in the girl's interest in math and science. Verbal strengths in boys and girls, we've already talked about that, and then emotional Problem-solving competence, stress tolerance, greater empathy, highly valued outcomes in our societies. But it also changes the men. <clears throat> they live longer, even though it doesn't feel like it when you're doing it, I know. Um, their marriages last a little longer. Level of health is higher. They take a greater responsibility for relationships. Rates of accidental death and suicide go down. They seem to be aware of their value to other people. They seem to have more stable jobs, and they're less aggressive and impulsive. This is an incredibly important finding that we have seen across communities where father engagement programs are available, that the appetite for violence seems to go down once you have stimulated and supported paternal nurturing capacities. And I want to emphasize that as one of the most important things that we've seen in our work in Turkey, 
um, and uh, the Middle East. Positive co-parenting, I'll, because of time, I'll let you look at this slide later. But we're, for my interest, father engagement is very important in its own right. But if it is not appropriately yoked to the partner that he is raising his child with, <clears throat> it will stand out in the field as something that's not part of the reproductive uh, 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 fertility of his garden. It, it just will not be engaged. And so that's why positive co-parenting, uh, we see it um, when mothers are able to support the father's contributions, not be so heavily gatekeeping. Um, engaging fathers in programs. I know a lot of you are very interested in doing this, and some very some advice that we have, addressing the maternal gatekeeping, both domestic and institutional. <clears throat> and it's always there. And it says, you know, mothers are the main focus. Fathers are ancillary. They're secondary. They're less important. Uh, that's not necessarily the way the child sees that. And so we have to be conscious as those of us who uh, derive programs. That's why I was asking you in the survey, Monkey, take a look at your own program. How do you, if you were a man walking into your service, would you feel welcome? Or is there someone for you to talk to? Is there unique information for you? Are there posters on the wall that show that men are welcome here? Addressing the dad's needs, father's esteem is highly related to their work life and their productivity. When they lose a job, they feel terrible as a father. That's not the case with mothers. They may feel more economically vulnerable, but they don't feel like a lousy mother. That is very true of fathers. Asking explicitly, fathers are involved here. We have programs for you. When you don't show up, we want to know why. We'll reschedule. Ask explicitly. And the successful programs are the ones that simply don't have the mothers do the asking. It's the clinicians that do the asking. Um, using local male talent, cultural competence. We found um, that um, sometimes we were our own worst enemies by trying to make sure that we were being culturally sensitive when the organizations we were working with said, don't worry about it, the values in this program are inculcated in our culture. You don't need to do all the fancy changing. Uh, we'll take it from here, thanks. And then, obviously, engaging fathers in programs whenever the child is sick, born, learning how to breastfeed, and when you're worried about the mother. <clears throat> A quick slide about paternal engagement and the battle against infant mortality. I know that you've been talking about AIDS, our deep concern about infant mortality, and UNICEF's deep concern about it. Some studies here associated between paternal involvement, infant mortality, and racial disparities. When the father's first and last name are on the child's birth certificate, you see protection going into, we don't quite understand why it works, but when the father is valued right from the beginning, children across many cultures are likely to be protected from infant mortality. Um, and again, the cause and effect, we're not quite sure how it connects, but it's a very important thing for us to be un uh, thinking about in terms of public health. <clears throat> My final slides have to do with a, a large study which I and my wife and our colleagues, Phil and Carolyn Cowan, have conducted with the migrant worker population in California, where we have been able to reduce the rates of abuse and neglect in these highly challenged families to practically zero, changing the children's behavior positively, reducing rates of, aggress of, of aggression, anxiety and depression in the mother and father, simply by involving the, earl the father early in the life of the child before the age of two. Um, other global paternal engagement discussions, uh, Gary Barker's wonderful ProMundo program, Men Care, and then you heard, uh, I believe, in the last webinar about the work going on in Turkey, um, which, I, uh, which we are extremely proud uh, to not only know of, but to occasionally to help with. So last slide again. Maybe you know a little bit more about what this slide might mean at this particular point. Thank you very much, Eduardo. Thank you so much, uh, Gary. Can, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Thank you so much, Gary. So mm, before we go to the presentation of Judy, maybe if uh, if uh, anyone has any question for for Kyle, otherwise we will go to we'll go to uh, Judith's presentation. And then we'll come back and we'll have more of a, of a session on question and answers, if that's okay.
Any questions from the participants? I see that uh, Moata's Zam is, is okay. Do you have a preference if these programs are for fathers only or for couples? That's the question from Hadir. When we have been able to accept both the mother and the father, our impact is far greater than when we work only with the fathers. That is not to say that working with the fathers is not effective. As the ACHA program in Turkey has shown, working directly with fathers can be quite effective. But the rather dramatic child outcome effects are more likely to be common uh, in programs that engage both fathers and mothers. What we have begun to do now in our interventions is encourage services to offer mixtures of both uh, to have, because there are some men who have so little engagement with their children um, that it would be very hard to use the resources. But when we are using what limited resources we have, we encourage mothers and fathers. Mothers need to come to terms with what it's like to have their children love their partners in unique and different ways. And when that happens, the mother's lives are often changed for the better as well. Thanks, Kyle. There are a couple of other questions. I don't know if I, um, I want to go to, to them or maybe we go to, to uh, Judith's presentation and then I will, I will take back the, uh, the, uh, the other two questions from Nina Ferencic and also, I had a question, but I will I will ask that later on. Should we move to to Judith's presentation and then we go back? Is that okay with you, Kai? Sure. Okay, uh, Judith, um, should we go to engaging men in HIV services in Malawi? We are delighted to have you there. Yes, and we're hoping that um, we're we yeah we're hoping the that the, we are not going to have technical problems because last time we it was a little bit tough and this morning it was so so right, Natalie? Yes. Um, and I'm not sure if Judith, I'm getting emails from Judith, but I'm not sure Judith can hear us. Let me see. Worst case scenario is um, I have Judith's notes. Yeah, let's so, let's give Judith just one minute yep. if she can if she can if she can uh, get a hold on us and, and okay. I just talk. yeah, I just got an email from Judith saying that she cannot hear us. The oh, no, no. the internet's okay. going in and out um, in the office. Uh, oh wait, Judith says, "Can you hear me?" Um, Judith, we can't. I'm going to um, start going through your presentation and let us know if you're able to chime in, and then I'll stop. Uh, I'm yeah, not the expert. Can I suggest? Yes. Yeah, can I suggest? So Natalie offered herself very also kindly to go through the presentation with uh, Judith notes. But Judith, as we can see, I, I don't know if you can hear us, but we can read your messages. So you can you can help navigate. Uh, uh, Natalie through the presentation and make maybe some notes on the conversation on the side of the of the screen and that probably will help to move the presentation forward. Is that okay, Natalie? It actually looks like Judith took over as the presenter. Oh, okay. Let's then let's try. Go ahead, Judith. Hmm. Nothing seems working. Okay, I'll take back over. Okay, so basically we asked Judith to give a presentation on a specific program that is, uh, that's been happening in Malawi connected to involving men in the prevention of mother-to-child transmission. Um, this is a slide giving a brief overview of uh, the prevalence in Malawi. Um, HIV prevalence declined in Malawi from 14% in 1994 to 10% in 2016. There's a significant reduction in new infections in infants, primarily due to prevention of mother-to-child transmission coverage. This is a success story. And um, 
14,500 HIV exposed infants were born in 2016. The rate of testing these infants for HIV is about 55% before their second birthday, which is a bit above uh, the global average. Um, and um, of course the goal is 100%. And among HIV positive children, 62% um, are on treatment. So looking to improve all of those figures. The male engagement program began in one district alongside the scale up of PMTCT, this prevention of mother to child transmission. The primary target group was male community members, while the intended beneficiaries were pregnant and breastfeeding women. In 2012, a bottleneck analysis of PMTCT was conducted, which showed that women's access to services was hampered by the behavior and attitudes of male partners. The program was scaled up and presently it's in 14 districts having trained approximately 7,400 men. The primary purpose continues to be to increase utilization throughout the PMTCT cascade, which is uh, antenatal care, couples HIV testing and counseling, antiretroviral therapy, skilled birth delivery, postnatal care, family planning, and early infant diagnosis of HIV. And I think all of these uh, elements really tie into what Kyle was saying in terms of uh, how helpful it is to have the male involved. Um, a secondary target group has been community leaders who have been who have played a critical role in promoting the program and emphasizing links with health facilities and health workers. Um, ownership by the district health officers and involvement of the traditional leaders and a strong linkage um, between health facilities, community health workers, and male motivators. In this photo, we had a, a photographer go out and um, follow around a uh, one of these male champions, and um, he's sitting to the to the right here, meeting with uh, a young mother and father, and encouraging them to be tested for HIV together in a high prevalence area. Um, men as partners. So around 20% of the HTC is with a partner, but in communities with male engagement, there are reported increases in couple HTC in antenatal care, skilled delivery. Qualitative review in 2016 uh, showed that changes in attitudes towards sexual reproductive health, family planning, child care, and quote unquote more love between the spouses. And there's, uh, there's less well-documented evidence of the impact on postnatal care and early infant diagnosis. Uh, motivating men, so this is just a, a little caption for this uh, um, male motivator who's been working since 2012 named Gordon. He said, as a, as a husband and father to three children, I'm passionate about helping other families and encouraging men to make better decisions. Um, and a nurse in one of the local, local clinics said, a male motivator should be humble, kind, and compassionate. He should have a good sense of humor, and most importantly, he should be able to keep secrets. That's an interesting tip. And the, the program de demonstrated that as men change their attitude and behaviors, they become effective advocates to peers and other community members. Uh, the program showed that positive change in men is possible through support to understanding the importance of PMTCT and encouraged men to become more involved in support and supportive of women's sexual and reproductive health needs, and they gain better access to sexual reproductive information and some services for themselves. Now, the key lessons and challenges, it was important to embed the program in districts and work through existing structures. Although these are hierarchical, it meant that the program became part of the health and community system. More challenging was monitoring so many, male so many of the male motivators. They keep careful records of their activities, which are then given to community health workers who compile them and give the report to the nurse in charge and so forth. A up the system. In retrospect, we're asking what information we need and what do the men and their communities need to measure results. For example, as, 
For example, can men's groups be a way to achieve social accountability and contribute to change? In 2016, we conducted a review of the male engagement program and some of the recommendations included improving men's utilization of services through male friendly health facilities, offering men the same package of services women receive during ANC, antenatal care, and taking a life cycle approach that includes expanding the, expanding the Know Your Child status campaign and involving men in the Care for Child Development Initiative, which is a, a UNICEF-led ECD program. Uh, speaking as Judith, she wrote, I'm going to briefly talk about ECD in Malawi, particularly as an opportunity for this expanded approach. There are 11,000 community-based ECD centers nationwide, 34,000 volunteer caregivers providing services to 1.4 million children, and 11% of those caregivers are men. The Care for Child Development is a well-known package to improve early childhood development, and it encourages men to become involved in parenting. A national study found that only 3% of biological fathers engage with their children, their young children, in learning activities. On the positive side, a small percentage of men are involved in functional literacy classes for young mothers. And I see that um, Judith is writing some comments um, on the side for everybody because she's actually the expert in this. Male friendly can mean many things, including safe places for men to leave their bicycles, the most m common mode of transportation, which um, I think is a really good point. And I know Eduardo would like to talk more to that too. Uh, men in a life cycle approach. In conclusion, we agree that men should be engaged in a life cycle approach. We we have an opportunity to build upon the male engagement and HIV program as both programs address men as partners and agents of change. Both take place in supportive communities and both recognize that men need to be engaged throughout a lifetime in order to fundamentally understand and address gender inequities and in child development. And um, I hear somebody's audio. I'm not sure if it's Judith. Uh, so uh, this is just an acknowledgement slide that um, that shows the uh, the photographer and the um, credits the Malawi Ministry of Health and implementing the different implementing districts of this uh, male champion model. And so really unfortunate that uh, that we weren't able to hear Judith give the presentation. She also said, but it also refers to Kyle's PowerPoint: what services are offered to men when they accompany their partners to antenatal care, etc. Um, and so, you know, I just read the, the notes from Judith's PowerPoint, which were really well written out, thankfully. I'll turn this back over to Eduardo. If um, participants have questions um, for Kyle or Judith, type those in the conversation um, bar. And um, Judith, keep on, keep on writing anything additional you want, um, you want the participants to know about this program. Okay, yeah, too bad that. Uh, thank you so much, Natalie, for doing a great job reading the reading the notes, and clearly it was a very good presentation. Sorry that Judith was not able to join us with the with the audio, but there were a lot of things, and there are some also questions there. And uh, I think with uh, with the, with this presentation, we can also engage uh, Kyle to um, to have some to address some of the questions and and comment on some of the points of the presentation. I am. Uh, there are a couple of things that uh, have been. Um, um, questions and uh, there, in particular, there is uh, something that I wanted to ask uh, uh, Judith more in more in detail, which is the use of the care for child development, which is this this program for uh, children under two. And so it seems that you have used it also for um, um, male engagement, or, or you have uh, ensured that male are, uh, men are not uh, left aside in the implementation of the CCD. So I would like maybe if you can write something on the on the conversation, Judith, on that, uh, because it is something that has been pointed out by several uh, 
country offices, including and regional offices. And I know that the Latin American Caribbean region is looking at enhancements of the implementation, the package of care for child development to ensure that men are engaged. Do you hear that, Judith, or do you want me to write it? I'm not sure. If, 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 do, do you know? OK, I'm going to write it. Judith. Otherwise, I, we will follow with Judith in, uh, after the webinar on this. Uh, two, two questions for, for Kyle. One of them was uh, male engagement for the life cycle. Um, someone was asking before, and I have to go back to see who was that person, uh, if um, what's the, OK, that's the evidence of impact hold true into adolescence or only during the early years in terms of male engagement and the positive outcomes of male engagement. Kyle, is, is that for the whole life cycle? It is for the whole life cycle. We emphasize the early childhood impacts because um, you get so much in English, we say bang for the buck. You get, it is such an economic use of society's resources to engage fathers early because you get an effect across the life cycle. However, we were talking earlier about attachment <laughs> differences. We are now aware that the father's engagement with the child positively through um, the pre-puberty years, uh, 10, 11, 12, may be every bit as important as the mother's engagement with her own infant. Because getting ready to handle what's about to happen to you biologically and socially um, so father's engagement actually strengthens its power as the child grows older. And so there is never a reason to be um, uh, unwelcoming of fathers when you are uh, in, involved with trying to improve the life of children. And you also hear, you know, fathers say, well, I wasn't there at the birth. She wouldn't let me near the kid. Um, I'm, I'm, but I'm really interested. Is it too late for me to involve? And <laughs> all you have to do is think how the child would answer that question. And of course, most children would say it's never too late, Dad. Um, and so we need to get our institutions in line with keeping that door open permanently, not just when, at times when it's convenient for us and the families. Thanks so much. I have a couple of other questions. One of them is, is there any negative outcome of not involving parents, or fathers? Is there any any um, uh, outcome that we can point at uh, as a negative uh, yeah, outcome if, if fathers are left aside? Because it seems that that happens often. Uh, it's a wonderful question. And um, we could spend the rest of the day talking about it, Eduardo. But I will say, I think the, um, to, to exclude the fathers, um, particularly to actively exclude the fathers, uh, puts the mother in a position where she, uh, she may think she has the control, uh, that she's always wanted by doing that. And it's easier to work with one person than two. And, uh, we have many workers that work with young children who are not, who are women and who are not very comfortable working with men because they've had negative experiences themselves about it. And by the, by the, by the way, those women are totally entitled to that experience. And if you as a program director have some on your staff and you're thinking about doing a more male engagement, you need to invite them and respect their, their part of the conversation because they need to have their say about how they feel about this. But you're going to eliminate a lot of those positive child outcomes uh, that I, you saw on that slide right. if you do not. And so um, it makes the mother even, it increases her gatekeeping responsibilities and sometimes her own behavior. And the child is watching you do that. The child is watching you sort of not invite the dad to school or not invite the dad uh, into the into the pediatrician's officer, uh, and they're watching that, and they are saying, hmm, I want, maybe dads don't belong here. But that's yeah, not exactly. the way, that's it. So that's the negative part. 
yeah, like reinforcing stereotypes. In, in terms, in, in line of this of this question and this and your answer, thanks so much, Kyle. Bridget Job Johnson was asking if there is any, uh, which are the, how does society view men who are involved what is considered traditionally as women's business? But interestingly enough, also Judy was saying that in 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 Malawi, for example, there was no resistance. It was more the opposite, that men were really very uh, much eager to, to participate. But does uh, society views uh, are negative or affect negatively these men or these, these children? My view on this um, reflects that of Gary Barker, which is um, that we as uh, society watchers and helpers are fairly far behind uh, the population that we're serving because of what's happened to the world economically and the fact that so many mothers have uh, found themselves needing to uh, try to make money and support their families economically. As the, as the economic pressures grow, there has been a profound change in this. Uh, and we, I have seen this in uh, I mentioned a half a dozen locales before. I've seen it that the we often, as watchers of society, are often more conservative than the societies we're watching. And the um, uh, women who are forming families now are often much more open to the idea of having a paternal uh, collaboration that is much more satisfying than the one her mother and father had about her. And that's, those, that's happening in a lot of different, in the East and the West and the North and the South. And we are, uh, a very important paper by Catherine Panterbrick that I reference in the slides <clears throat> about the game changing, uh, occurrence of paternal involvement that is, a, that is happening at a grassroots level. And we need to, uh, we need to, <laughs> we need to catch up with that. So I think that the, um, the the uh, due to this image of having a place for the men to park their bicycles outside the clinics, I want that to be seared into everybody's mind because the men will come if they are welcome and expected and you set the table for them. And having a secure place for them to leave their bicycle out front, which the women don't use, says to them, you are welcome and important here. And the children see that. Yeah, you, you, you underline a lot the modeling there, right? One, yes. one, can, can I go back on, on one of your slides? Because I was fascinated by one of the things that you show. Uh, two, 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 um, two data there. One is that uh, paternal, postpartum paternal depression. You said there is uh, one, uh, uh, like basically half of the, of the, um, for every two women with postpartum uh, maternal depression. There is one man with uh, with depression. Uh, if you yes. could elaborate a little bit on that, and the, and the second one is maybe this is a little bit per, a little bit too personal, but I think any father who is uh, who is among the participants or any father knows that if you are in a in in a deliver in the delivery of your child, uh, there is clearly huge changes in your body. And I said that for personal experience. When you are there at the birth of your child, you just experience this incredible, massive happiness. Uh, I don't know exactly what is in your brain, but really it goes bananas. Uh, I'm sure there is massive uh, uh, amounts of uh, oxytocin that goes up and down. And you, you become incredibly sensitive, anyways, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to go too, too much into the details of what happened to me, but is there any research on that that you could uh, also elaborate a little bit uh, upon? Thanks. Yes, there is, Eduardo, and thank you for, I thought going bananas was, I thought that was just, <laughs> I thought that. <laughs> I'm, I thought I'm going that to contact you after the webinar also because I want to hear yeah. this much more in detail. <laughs> the, um, the work of Jim Lechman and Ruth Feldman has shown that the moment of birth and the amount of oxytocin that is released in the brain and the skin of the father, oxytocin is produced in many places throughout the body, is at a, it is, as, it is at a, as I called it, historic high levels before. And I'm not going to blame oxytocin, but I am going to say it's a very, good facilitator of what begins to happen between the father and the infant visually and hormonally. 
the smell of the baby, the touch of the baby, the skin-to-skin contact between the child, and it is a wise nurse that brings the father close and holds him and supports him while he maybe gives the baby the first bath or cuts the cord or ties the cord or supports the mother because the father is, uh, that this is, we would call this an imprinting moment. And so it is akin to some of the habits formed in the brain, in the brain with obsessive compulsive disorder. And you are having a momentarily, uh, you're momentarily obsessed with your infant. And it's the same part of the brain that is slightly out of balance in OCD. And it was uh, Jim Lechman who, uh, was the first person to kind of take a look at that. So that's that research. In terms of the hormone, the, the comorbidity of paternal depression, that comes from a large epidemiologic study that was done in uh, the county of Avon in England, where they looked at 15,000 families, followed them over time, did questionnaires. And again, it's a population study, not a clinical study. So they were just looking at health um, indicators and health outcomes and they gave depression rating scales to the fathers and the mothers, and that was where this very high number of depressed fathers was discovered for the first time, and it's been replicated since. So it's good science, and it means we ought to be changing the way that we are monitoring depression during pregnancy for both mothers and fathers. Okay, wow, that's very interesting. And I, I presume we have we have also some studies on how to treat to treat uh, father postpartum depression. It is fairly simple to treat it once you recognize it. Um, the uh, medications and counseling are quite effective um, when you use them. <laughs> They're not effective when you don't, and okay. so you you have to look for it, and it is often a surprise to the father when you start asking him if he's feeling the following things and he says yes how did you know and you're just going down your diagnostic checklist and these are the kinds of things that the primary health providers um, are beginning to pick up on and do um, yeah yeah there are a couple of there are a couple of interesting questions there on the on the conversation Kyle and and uh, and Judith uh, one of them is from from Songa Chai who talks about, ask about the false sense of engagement by fathers. He, she, she or he, I don't know, uh, says, uh, the, how do we engage fathers who feel they are involved because they are the decision makers, but in fact they really don't interact with children. Uh, and, and Vivian asks uh, about different parenting styles is one thing, but how do these programs address fathers whose parenting may differ dramatically from the mothers? Like for example, one believes in corporal punishment and the other and the other don't. Songa is a C, so sorry, Songa. I'm very sorry about that. Uh, so she, she's asking about this false sense of engagement. Yes, uh, uh, thinking that you are engaged because you make decisions, but you are actually don't interacting with the child. Um, a historical note. Um, when uh, uh, my father was raising me, um, he felt extremely engaged because he paid the mortgage and he supported uh, his wife in uh, parenting me. And he also knew when I was out of line and when I was being disrespectful to her. Those were things that were very important to him. And he would be judged as a very effective father by the standards of the 1950s. We now have a different set of standards, and the this set of false engagement is something that I have certainly seen um, in often first or second generation families that come uh, to the States where the father calls himself exactly as the questioner says, I'm very engaged because I'm involved in where I send the child to school and I pay for it and I am involved in helping to choose the physician. And um, but the mother is often feeling very alone with the child and as though she's uh, not receiving his support. Uh, if you as a clinician uh, have been um, if you're aware of this and the family has asked for help in changing it, it's not a thing you can impose on families. But if the family has asked for assistance, one of the best 
uh, quote, treatments for the falsely engaged father is time alone with his child. And in those moments alone with the child, he will begin, the child and he will begin uh, to form a more authentic relationship. And the father's support uh, becomes more hands-on because of the needs of caring for that child. Now, if the father refuses to do that um, for whatever reason, then at least you're now aware of the father, of the fact that the father and the mother need some support and sort of saying, you know, I need you closer and so do your children. Uh, but again, these are, these are, these are very sensitive and kind of thin ice questions for families, but I am very aware of the, of the phenomenon. Exactly. I think both, both questions, uh, Songa and, and Vivian are really pointing at clearly the need of engaging of both uh, fathers and mothers and all the caregivers actually to have coherent messages and to have a coherent way of, uh, of, of parenting because what the worst thing it can happen is when you have uh, one of the caregivers giving a message, message or having a style that is uh, completely clashing with the, with the style and the, and the way of parenting of the other caregiver. Um, so I said caregivers that in, in a way because that could be also, you know, the case of a child being raised by uh, mothers, fathers or, grandpa or grandparents, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, the, that is that is I like that they are asking those questions because they are basically reinforcing the need of engaging both fathers and, and mothers. Exactly. We are we're just three minutes uh, uh, to, to ten and I don't want to, to take too, too much time from everyone. I, I do want to mention um, to Karen, to, to Judith, and to all the participants that there is going to be a global campaign, or actually we call it the global campaign because it's global and it's local, on early childhood development that is going to be launched in, in January. Probably many of you know about this. It has been in the making for, for more than a year, I think. It's going to be the first campaign of UNICEF ever on early childhood development. And right now we are looking specifically at within this campaign to to promote uh, fathers' engagement and male engagement. And uh, and actually after this webinar, I have to talk to our Department of Communication to uh, to work together on how this is going to be part of the campaign. And so I am very excited that it's good timing that uh, these webinars, your intervention, Kyle and Judith. Um, uh, you know, I come in in the moment that we are looking at this to scale up and to to have this as one of the priorities for UNICEF worldwide. Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in and say thank you for everybody for uh, being part of this. And we have a recording of the webinar that we'll share. I have I have everybody's name written down. We'll share the recording so that you can share it with colleagues, and um, and we can also share presentations at the, uh, and the permission of Kyle and Judith. Yeah, and, and Kyle and you, if you allow us, we would love to, to share also your presentations. Well, I will review the slides and make sure you have a copy that I'm comfortable with. Um, and yes, giving you credit out for, the, for, for whatever you sent to us. That would be okay. great. Okay. And congratulations on the, on, the, on the global campaign, because I think to have a strong, not simply add-on component for paternal engagement, will give it an incredibly important boost for the people who are out there wondering what to do. Judith's idea of the male champion um, is just highly effective in these kind of community-oriented organizations, and it's just the kind of thing that UNICEF ought to be helping people understand how to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Judith. And thank you, all the participants. Thank you also, Natalie, for organizing so beautifully and to, to take also over on the presentation when we have those technical problems. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, evening. Bye-bye.